Father, again, we thank you for uh, the joy it is that we can gather together like this, that we can sing our praises to you, uh, that we can lift up our hearts to you in prayer. And we thank you above all that you, our gracious God, speak to us, uh, that these are words recorded by uh, Luke, the physician, uh, for the benefit of the early believers, uh, written under the inspiration of your spirit for us, and that these stories that we read about the life of Saul, Paul, and others, uh, again, are not just written so that we can know our history, but so that uh, through the life of Saul, uh, we can know more of you and your gracious dealings with your people through all time. So, Lord, give us ears to hear, we pray, and hearts to receive your word, and we ask that you'd strengthen us to serve and love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, uh, last time we were together, last uh, Sunday morning, we began to look at um, uh, the conversion story of one of the most remarkable men in Christian history. If you look at your New Testament, probably roughly half of it uh, thereabouts is written by this man, Saul the Pharisee, uh, the persecutor of Jesus' first followers, after he become Paul the Apostle, a committed servant and a joyful servant or a joyful slave of this same Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, we'll turn to the aftermath of Paul's conversion, what happened next, to see the difference the gospel made in the way that he lived and the priorities of his life from that point forward. But before we go there, I want to consider for a moment the conversion story of another significant person in Christian history. Some centuries later, you'll uh, probably know um, something of Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but the guy he was named after, Martin Luther, who uh, in 1517 nailed a bunch of uh, writings that he called his 95 Theses um, to the uh, castle church, the door of the castle church in Wittenburg. It was October the 13th, 1517, a seemingly innocent act at the time. This was just the way that you signaled you wanted to debate some things with your fellow priests and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, what's the word, scholars. But that seemingly innocent act led, finally, to a fundamental break between those who were convinced of Luther's arguments and the Roman Catholic Church of his day. Now, there is, to be honest, some controversy over when Luther was converted. Uh, The traditional view tends to be uh, that he was converted sometime before um, he wrote his 95 Theses. But there are credible arguments that say um, that actually it was, he was in a process of transition. It was maybe only a year or two after that that he finally came to fully understand what it means that we are justified by faith, that God doesn't require us to become righteous, to be accepted by him, but that he declares us righteous, he makes us righteous through the cross of his son. But wherever Luther was converted, the moment of truth came for him in 1521, uh, when four years after, uh, after four years rather of dithering and delaying, the Roman Catholic Church finally realised they needed to take action. They brought him to the city of Worms and they required him to stand before the Roman Emperor Charles V to answer charges of heresy. He was presented with his copies of his writings and he was asked two questions. Were these writings his and did he stand by their contents? Luther actually didn't answer the question straight away. He asked for uh, time to consider his response. And so he was allowed to go away and to think about it and come back the next day. And 24 hours later, his interrogation resumed. And as he then gave his reply, Luther said among the following, Your Imperial Majesty and your Lordship, so that's the King and the heads of the Catholic Church, demand a simple answer. Here it is, plain and unvarnished. Unless I'm convicted of error by the testimony of Scripture... Or, since I put no trust in the unsupported authority of Pope or councils, since it's plain that they've often erred and often contradicted themselves by manifest reasoning, I stand convicted by the scriptures to which I've appealed, and my conscience is taken captive by God's word. I think Luther's a bit like me, long convoluted sentences where you can't work out what the the beginning was by the time you get to the end, but leave that there. Um, My conscience is taken captive by God's word. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to act against our conscience is neither safe for us nor open to us. And then famously, uh, Luther's final words uh, in that declaration, here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. In other words, if you're going to find me guilty of heresy, and if you're going to put me to death, that is your choice. But I can do nothing other than stand by the truths of which I've become convinced, the truth that God is a God 
who justifies sinners, who rescues sinners from their sin. Not a God who works through the church to convince you you've got to try harder. Luther had come to understand the truth about God and salvation and eternity. He was therefore willing to determine to live for the truth and was willing to die for it. Not unlike the Apostle Paul, or again this man Saul, to whose story we're about to come. I want to just draw one last contrast, though, before we do that, between Luther and Saul, that we'll begin to see in today's passage. If you know anything about the history of Luther, you'll know he was amazingly insightful, but also gloriously inconsistent, that throughout the course of his life he flip-flopped on a number of key theological issues um, and continued to hold some theological positions to the time of his death that, quite frankly, were bizarre. Paul, on the other hand, was amazingly consistent and clear. From the moment of his conversion, he seemed to have a profound grasp, both of the gospel of Christ and its implications, which is why in the verses we have in front of us, Paul doesn't head off to some kind of ministry boot camp to get his doctrine straight. No sooner has he been converted than he's out and about proclaiming the message that only days before he'd been seeking to stamp out. And though it may well be that for most of us, we need more time to wrap our minds around the gospel, it's worth asking the question for ourselves, uh, those who call ourselves Christians, what evidence do people see in our lives that we've understood the gospel? What evidence do people see that the gospel has taken hold of us and that Jesus truly is our Lord and Saviour? Whether we have the preaching abilities of Paul or not, do we have the courage of Paul, the courage of our convictions that says, along with Luther, here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. Three passages, sorry, three headings uh, under which we'll look at our passage uh, this morning. Saul the preacher, Saul the plot victim, and Saul the persecuted. Beginning halfway through verse uh, 19 with that first heading, Saul the preacher, we read, for some days he, that is Saul, was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come now here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Let's quickly remind ourselves of the reason that Saul was in Damascus, to which these guys refer in those verses. The beginning of Acts 9 saw Saul going to the Jewish religious leadership in Jerusalem uh, to ask for their help in stamping out the movement that had sprung up around Jesus' disciples. And not just in Jerusalem, but now wherever it had spread. And his first port of call uh, in that uh, project was this city of Damascus, about 150 miles away uh, from Jerusalem, outside of the provinces of Judea and Samaria, but in a, uh, but a city that had a large Jewish population where the gospel was beginning to take root. So with letters of reference from the high priest himself, Saul had set off to Damascus to enlist the hope, help of the local synagogue leaders there to identify and to arrest any followers of Jesus. That had been Saul's original intent. But now finally he's arrived at his destination, the synagogues in Damascus. But somewhere along the way, it seems like his letters of reference have been misplaced. Or if he still has them, he certainly doesn't use them, does he? More fundamentally, Paul's intended mission has undergone a dramatic transformation. He's no longer there to arrest and persecute the followers of the way. He's come to proclaim the message that they believe. Somewhere towards the end of the Damascus Road, as we saw last week, the Lord Jesus has performed radical heart surgery on this man. And there is no mistaking the difference that that's made. There is something of an irony in this, isn't there, friends? Uh, the fact, in fact, most of what Saul does in the next ten verses, I think, is meant to be seen as somewhat ironic or unexpected. Saul's hostility towards Christ has driven him in one direction. But his encounter with Christ on the Damascus Road has turned him completely around. Saul is now preaching the message he had sought to shut down in the very places he had thought to capture Jesus' disciples. I like the way F.F. F. Bruce puts it in his commentary. He says, it was to the synagogues of Damascus that Paul had been sent with the commission from the high priest and to the synagogues he went. But instead of presenting his letters of credence and demanding the extradition of the disciples of Jesus... He appeared as the bearer of a very different commission issued by a higher authority than the high priests. And as a disciple and messenger of Jesus, he announced his master's claims. All those who'd heard him were told were gobsmacked, 
that's a, probably a pretty good translation of the text we find in verse 21, totally surprised and amazed. It's not only the believers who were aware of Saul's designs. Uh, word had obviously gotten around the wider Jewish community of the mission that had brought him to Damascus. But as with Jesus, now so with Saul, the murmuring of the crowd doesn't faze him. He's not worried what they think about him. He has a message to proclaim, and he's determined to proclaim it. He wants them to know about the one who's turned him around. Let's take a message, though, to ask the question, what exactly was Saul's message? We're not given a a comprehensive picture of it here, are we? Although we will see some of Saul's later uh, sermons, both Jews and Gentiles, later in the book of Acts. Uh, Saul, again, who calls himself Paul later, Hebrew name and a Greek name. Right now it's Saul, but if I call him Paul, I hope you'll forgive me. Luke sums Saul's message up here, though, in just two brief statements. In verse 21, he tells us that Saul's message was that Jesus is the Son of God. And then in verse 22, Saul's claim is that Jesus is the Christ. Let's take that second one first. What does it mean for Saul to proclaim Jesus as the Christ? Well, the Greek word Christos, like the Hebrew word uh, Messiah or Messiah, means anointed one. And in the Old Testament, that word was used to describe people who had been consecrated or set apart, typically by anointing, for some particular service. Prophets, priests and kings were all recognised as having been consecrated or anointed by God for the ministries he entrusted to them. Uh, More than that, though, the Old Testament scriptures pointed forward to a coming Messiah, if you like, a supreme anointed one, uh, a coming anointed saviour, whom God would send into the world for the final rescue of his people. And Saul, in declaring that Jesus is not a Christ, but the Christ, is saying that Jesus is the anointed one, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the promised rescuer for whom Israel have been waiting all these centuries. He is the one who is coming for the rescue of God's people. And then what of the other title, verse 21, that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, this is the only time we find that particular title in the book of Acts. And it's no coincidence that we should find it on the lips of Saul. Saul has just encountered the risen Lord Jesus on the road and his experience has driven him to the unmistakable conclusion that Jesus is not simply God's chosen king. He is the son of God. He is the uh, the man born, born on earth whose existence predated his birth on earth. He's the one who was with God and was God from before the beginning of time. Let me quote Bruce again here. He says, as applied to our Lord, the title Son of God marks him out as the true representative of the Israel of God and as God's anointed king. But it's no merely official title as he himself understood the heavenly voice which said to him at his baptism, you are my son. It expressed his unique relationship and fellowship with the father. Jesus, in other words, was and is God. That's the idea implicit in this title as it's applied now to Jesus. Now, three more brief points to make about this early preaching of Paul before we move on. The first of which is the power with which Jesus preaches. The verb that Luke uses here uh, to to describe Paul becoming stronger in his preaching, uh, the verb endumao is related to the noun dunamis, from which we get the English word dynamite, the word that Luke uses to describe Jesus' miracles or works of power in the Gospels. In other words, Paul's not simply showing a greater power of personality as he preaches. He's increasingly demonstrating the empowerment of God as his chosen messenger to proclaim the message he's been given. So as God's word goes forth, as it's preached by God's appointed representative, it goes forth with God's power and God's authority. That's true of Saul. It's true of every faithful preacher of the gospel today. Secondly, the the method Paul uses, how does Paul prove that Jesus is the Christ? It's an interesting question, isn't it? How does Paul prove that Jesus is the Christ? We understand that in maths you can, you know, prove certain things with different formulae and whatever else. We can ask our resident maths teacher about that later. Uh, In science you can prove certain theorems to be true or certain equations to be true, at least within the limits of our understanding by doing experiments and showing. How do you prove that Jesus is the Christ? Christ? 
Well, Paul does so by pointing his hearers to the Old Testament scriptures. And if you're wondering where I get that from, the verb that Paul uses here is significant. The Greek word translated to prove carries the idea of bringing together or of placing together, of marshalling all the relevant facts and evidences. So what does Saul do to prove that Jesus is the Christ? He brings together the promises contained in the Old Testament that he knew so well as a Jewish rabbi, as a Pharisee. And he places them alongside the claims of Christ that he now knows to be true and the accounts of Jesus' life and death and resurrection that are demonstrably true to demonstrate, perhaps that's better, a better word than prove, that in Jesus the fulfilment of God's promises has come to pass. So again, that's just important for us today, isn't it? As it was for people back then. If Jesus is the Christ, if that can be proven, demonstrated, that Jesus is the one in whom all God's promises come to fulfilment, then if you want to know real life, a life that goes beyond the grave, if you want to know real forgiveness, if you want to know the presence and the goodness of God in your life here and now, there's only one way to find that. It's by coming to the one that God has promised is the one who brings forgiveness, the one who brings life. Then thirdly and finally, at least on this point, let me draw your attention to the tenses Paul uses when he speaks of Jesus. I notice as I compared the various translations that there's some variation here, but in the Greek it's clear. Saul's message is not that Jesus was the Son of God or that Jesus was the Messiah. Remember on the Damascus, sorry, on the Damascus Road, on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, Jesus' disciples saying, we had thought that he was the Messiah, but in the night of his death we're not so sure. No, Paul doesn't say Jesus was the Son of God or was the Messiah. He claims that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And again, that's absolutely crucial, isn't it? The voice Saul heard on the road to Damascus was not some kind of disembodied voice from beyond the grave. The ghost of Jesus come back to haunt him. No, it was the voice of the risen, ascended Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus who was and is alive forevermore. And again, in the words of Stephen, just back in chapter 7 is standing or is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Do you remember that strange-sounding passage in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul speaks of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances? He says that Jesus died in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, that he was buried and raised on the third day. But then goes on to say he first appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, and then to various other witnesses. And then in verse 8 he says, Last of all, as to one untimely born or as the NIV translates it, to one abnormally born, he appeared also to me. Paul himself saw the risen and ascended Lord Jesus Christ, saw him after his ascension and before his promised return. And that's probably what he means by saying, as to one untimely born, it was after the ascension. So after Jesus had physically walked on earth and before his return, it's out of the normal time sequence or order of events. That's when I saw Jesus. And in seeing him, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the one that I'd been persecuting and whom I must now submit to was the risen, ascended saviour. Not someone who was and is no more, but one who is son of God and saviour now and forever. And again, that's a vitally important message for us to grasp hold of, isn't it? Because otherwise we will distort the gospel message as we share it with others today. We do tend to speak of Jesus' ministry in the past tense. And that's appropriate because Jesus' life on earth is past tense, as are his death and resurrection. They're historical events. They happen in history. But unless Jesus is still alive, unless he is alive forevermore, then it's all kind of pointless, isn't it? We're peddling old-fashioned morality based on the teachings of a long-dead guru instead of the life giving message of Christ, crucified and risen for our forgiveness and life. And friends, you'll know this. There are churches that do that. There are theologians who will say to you that the body of Jesus is still buried somewhere, or at least the bones of Jesus are still scattered somewhere on the hills or slopes or under the ground in Palestine today. That is not what the Bible teaches. And that is not a faith worth having. Because the only one who can save us from death is one who himself has defeated death. And that is what scripture teaches us, that Jesus both died and is risen. And therefore is the one whose cross is the place where we find the power uh, of God to defeat death. 
to defeat sin and to grant eternal life to those who trust in him. Remember, Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17 and 19, that if Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile and we're still in our sins. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, in other words, if all knowing Jesus does is enables us to live a better life here and now, then we of all people are most to be pitied. Why? Because we live out our lives by a higher standard for, for higher values than others. And then we end up in the same grave along with everyone else. What's the point? What's the value Paul asks in there? So, a risen saviour. A, a risen saviour who fulfils God's promises and is the one to whom we must turn. We're now ready to, to move on to the response of Paul's, to Paul's preaching in Damascus and the opposition it eventually provokes. But before we do, I want to reflect briefly on what I mentioned at the beginning, this theological constancy of the Apostle Paul. The message we find Saul preaching here, even though we only get a snippet, the message we find him preaching um, throughout the rest of the book of Acts is essentially the same message we find Paul proclaiming in every one of the letters he wrote throughout his life that are preserved for us in the scriptures. There is little evidence that Paul changed his mind about anything once his theological understanding was developed. There's no evidence that he changed his mind about anything of theological significance which prompts me to ask the question for us, uh, is that the way that we should be? Uh, again, I know people who say, I've made up my mind, I know the truth, don't confuse me with the facts. Is that what I'm suggesting should be our attitude here? Well, no. Um, th th there are um, people, aren't there, you look at through Christian history, who have the same kind of consistency of Paul. People who knew John Calvin, or who studied John Calvin, for example, will say that Calvin's opinions didn't fundamentally change throughout his life. They simply deepened and became more clearly articulated. Um, that's certainly true of the apostles from Pentecost onward. Uh, you never see Paul or Peter issuing retractions in one letter of something they've said in the previous. There is one point at which we need to be prepared to stand fixed and firm and say, of this I'm convinced, and I cannot change. But having said that, there is room for us as people to change our minds, isn't it? Why? Well, because we're not the apostles, because we are fallible, because our understanding is limited, and because the whole purpose of studying the Scriptures is that as we study the Scriptures, we come to a better understanding of who God is and how he works in history and how he works in the lives of his people. Uh, one of the things I've noticed, sadly, of Christians is that they head in the other direction, that as they grow older, they start to go off the boil, uh, that as they, uh, particularly church pastors, as they work their way up the ecclesiastical ladder, uh, they become more and more concerned that if I speak out too strongly on certain things, it's not going to go well for me. As an ex-Anglican, I, I well remember the saying, and I'm sure Trevor remembers this too, um, that one of, the, um, uh, one of the things that is done to a a, uh, a presbyter as he becomes a bishop, uh, one of the, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, one of the um, ceremonies that they need to carry out is to remove his spine because a bishop with a spine, a bishop with too many convictions is just no use to the church. Now, that is a joke and there are plenty of bishops out there who really do have the strength of their convictions. But you do see it sometimes, don't you? All the pastors, all the preachers uh, who stop holding so firmly to the beliefs they once had who start wanting to pursue peace and harmony instead of getting caught in endless contention, who start to capitulate, not because they become convinced of the need to change their minds, but because it's no longer convenient to be seen uh, as a contrarian. So what's my point here? What's the question I'm asking? I'm asking the question, if you do change your mind on something of significance and substance when it comes to the truth of God's word, are you changing your mind because the word of God itself is convicting you uh, as God's spirit works in you, you're coming to recognise that, that some of the things you believe were not quite right. There's a place for that. And those of you who've been here over the last 19 years will know from time to time, I'll say, look, I think as I've studied the scriptures more closely, I've come to realise I need to change this or that in my understanding. That's a good and a healthy thing to do. But there is a danger as we grow older and as we want more comfort and more peace that we head in the other direction. It's not the word of God that's convicting me that I need to change my attitude. It's the desire for peace and for acceptability. So if we're going to change our minds on something, it needs to be on the basis of conviction, not convenience. 
the Apostle Paul, consistent through his life? Is that the way that we're going to seek to be consistent? Uh, if we are going to change, consistent even there, in that our change is into greater conformity with God's word as it convicts and shapes us. Second heading, which will be a lot briefer, and then the third will be a tiny bit longer again. Verse 23, saw the plot victim. We read, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. If you ever tried to map out the chronology of Saul's life, you'll know that Luke's not telling us everything here. Uh, According to Paul himself in Galatians 1, the many days of verse 23 added up to roughly three years. Though depending on the way Paul counted time, uh, that could be a part of three years. It could be as as brief a time as 18 months. Uh, Paul also tells us that some of that time was spent in Arabia. That is in the Nabataean kingdom just to the south of Damascus. It wasn't all within the city. And during that time, according to 2 Corinthians 11, he managed to provoke the hostility of the Nabataean king. So again, Paul was consistent in this too. Paul was consistently truthful and he was consistently a thorn in the side of those who didn't want to hear the truth. In any case, Saul's preaching, perhaps both in Damascus and Arabia, eventually does provoke such hostility that some of his fellow Jews decide to hatch a plot to dispatch him forthwith. So determined were they to do this to him, we're told, that in verse 24, they set up a 24-hour watch on the city gates, watching day and night to make sure he didn't escape without them seeing it, so that they could carry out their plans. Ironic, isn't it? Again, Saul, the persecutor, now finds himself being persecuted for the sake of the gospel. The time has now come for Saul to leave the city of Damascus. And when he does so, his parting is almost as undignified as his arrival. Led into Damascus uh, three years earlier, blinded and humbled, forced to rely on someone else to lead the way. And now departing Damascus under cover of night, almost a coward's escape, plunked into a large basket or maybe even a fishing net and lowered from an opening in the city wall. His disciples, that is the men and women who have been won to the gospel through his preaching, now uh, as an expression of their support and their love of him, risking their lives to save his by enabling him to escape. Again, friends, that is the life of discipleship, if we have the stomach for it. Occasional moments of glory, just every now and again maybe. Opportunities for powerful witness as God enables us to speak his word. But as often as not, alongside that, opposition, rejection, Hostility from those who, to whom we're seeking to communicate God's truth and God's love. We tell people that in God, sorry, in Jesus, God has sent us a rescuer. That we do not need to face the ultimate penalty of judgment in hell. And the response to so many is, don't talk to me about sin, don't talk to me about hell. I don't want to believe in any of that stuff. And so I don't want or need your saviour. I can imagine Paul as he's lowering, being lowered to the ground under cover of darkness and no doubt banging into the wall as the, uh, as the basket is lowered, maybe thinking to himself, I didn't sign up for this. And of course, if that's what he was thinking, he was right. He didn't sign up for it any more than you or I do. Uh, if we are followers of Christ called to proclaim him, it's not something we sign ourselves up for. It's something God calls us to do. Uh, and it's something he graciously has done in and for us as the gospel of Jesus has made us new. The call to faith, the call to believe in Christ, the call to belong to Christ, brings with it a call as we're able to make him known, to share with others the hope that we have found in him. And Saul's experience here is something we have to be prepared for if we're going to take that on board. There will be people who will rejoice to hear the gospel as you share it with them. And there will be people who will respond to the gospel, even loved ones and friends, who respond to the gospel as you share it, with hostility, indignation and ridicule. Are we prepared to accept that for the sake of the one who's given us life? Well, let's turn to the final episode of Paul's story, and I think I'm going to stop just one verse early at verse 30. Um, in this final section, remember chapter 9 began with Saul riding out from Jerusalem, intent on conquest and glory in a fashion, but his return is somewhat, again, less glorious than he'd anticipated. No no doubt the local religious authorities were aware that he'd switched jerseys 
and there have been none too thrilled about that. Uh, but his fellow believers in Jerusalem don't seem as convinced as the religious authorities do that such a change has taken place. They're none too sure that they want him on their side. Verse 26, we read, when he'd come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. I guess you can understand that, can't you? Last time this guy came knocking on your door, it was to drag you out by the hair and throw you into prison. Now, two to three years later, he's back knocking on your door again. You're just going to be a little bit less likely to open it up, aren't you? What if these stories about his conversion are just a ruse? What if this is propaganda, a way of getting in under our guard? A sophisticated attempt to infiltrate the movement so Saul can do even greater damage from the inside than he was ever able to do from the outside. The Jerusalem disciples, the apostles no doubt included, have demonstrated their faith and their loyalty to the cause of Christ. But no matter how great their faith, they have trouble believing that God could really change the heart of a man like Saul. But he can, and he has, and he continues to do the impossible today. I mentioned this last week, so I'll say it a bit more briefly today, but this, I think, for me, is one of the great encouragements when you read the book of Acts. If God can change the heart of the man most hostile to the gospel, uh, if God can change the heart of someone who you would look at and say, humanly speaking, there is no way he moves from here to here. That same God is capable of changing the hardest heart that you know. So who is it in your workplace? Who is it in your schoolyard? Who is it among your friends or family? Who is it among your neighbours that is the most hostile, the most resistant, uh, the most uh, uh, aggressive towards you? Look to the world scene and you see people like um, Vladimir Putin who claim some kind of Christian faith but whose life is a radical denial of it. Could God even change the heart of a man like him? Well, I think the answer of scripture is yes, he can. Now, I, I, I don't know who God's going to call, and I don't know who's going to remain resistant. God knows, not me. But passages like this give us hope, don't they? Uh, that the people in your family who you think are long since gone, no hope left, you can continue to pray for. That as God dealt with Saul, so he might deal with them. And obviously there's at least one person in Jerusalem who thinks that way about Saul. Because eventually Barnabas, who you remember we met in chapter 5. His real name is Joseph. Barnabas is a nickname. Barnabas means son of encouragement. And he's called son of encouragement because that is what he consistently does. It's this man who perhaps more than any other in Jerusalem understands how to come alongside someone, recognise their faith and move them on. He now takes charge of the situation. We read verse 27, but Barnabas took Saul and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he'd seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Now, how does Barnabas know about this change that's taken place in Saul's life? Is he the only one who'd heard from the believers in Damascus that Saul had been miraculously converted on the way there. Was he the only one inclined to believe those reports, though others had heard them? Or was he perhaps the only one willing to take the risk of approaching Paul and inviting him to tell his story so he could hear firsthand why Saul the persecutor was now Saul the preacher? However it was that Barnabas became familiar with Saul's story, do you notice verse 27 tells us it was Barnabas and not Saul who first brought Saul to the apostles and then recounted to them the story of how Saul had seen the risen Lord Jesus Christ and heard his voice. It was Saul uh, who then went, sorry, it was Barnabas rather, who then went on to tell them how Saul had dared to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus in the synagogues and the streets of Damascus and surrounds. And it's a good thing that Barnabas models for us, isn't it? Not to just believe every conversion story you hear necessarily, but to be willing to take the risk of asking, to actually get alongside people and say, so tell me, what's your story? Where are you before the Lord Jesus Christ? And if the answer is, this is how God has dealt graciously with me, not just to be willing to accept, but then to commend our fellow believers to others. So Saul then is accepted by the disciples. And not only that, is now enabled to preach the gospel in Jerusalem as he had in Damascus beforehand. 
Now that he's been accepted, what would you expect him to do? Again, probably, (laughs) for you and me, uh, you'd expect him to want to spend some time at the disciples' feet to ask questions, to fill in the gaps in his knowledge, uh, to, uh, to drink in the fellowship of the body of believers. But, well, maybe Paul did do some of that. We don't know. But the focus that Luke gives us here is on what Paul does outside of that. Paul, on the road to Damascus, received a commission. And he's serious about following that through. His commission is to preach the gospel. As he says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16, later on, necessity is laid upon me, woe to me, If I do not preach the gospel. So there in Jerusalem, uh, the place where Saul had spent some of his most important years, the place where Saul of Tarsus had come to sit at the feet of Gamaliel and to learn the ways of the Pharisees, the place where Saul had marked himself out as one of the most prominent and one of the most capable Jewish scholars in that very city, Saul now comes and preaches the gospel. And actually more than that, where are we told that he preaches the gospel? Where specifically? Well, we're told that he preaches the gospel, especially to his fellow Greek-speaking Jews. The very people among whom Saul had been numbered when Stephen had come preaching the gospel. The very group of people who had been responsible with Saul's approval for Stephen's death. Now Saul takes up the cudgel with the very people who three years earlier had put Stephen to death for proclaiming Jesus as the Christ. And he does so preaching the same message that Stephen himself had preached. Now, I want to suggest to you, friends, that again, Saul is giving us an example here of one of the hardest things that a Christian can do, but something that's important for us to do. It's relatively easy when you become a Christian and start again to go out and find a whole new bunch of people to hang out with and associate with, to start making friends with Christians and maybe sharing the gospel with non-Christians you don't know. The hardest thing, isn't it, is to go back to the places that you're known, the places where your pre-conversion life was lived, uh, the people who knew the person that you were, and to say to them, here is how my life has changed and here is who Jesus is. But that is what we find Paul doing here, speaking specifically to those kinds of people who'd known the pre-converted Saul and saying to them, now I trust in Christ and here is why. One of the hardest things to do, especially if we expect that our friends are going to oppose and resist, and yet the greatest privilege of all, because who is in a better position to say to someone, here is the life transforming power of the gospel, than someone Uh, who you knew before and in whom you can see, yeah, yeah, indeed, as he says, or as she says, the message that they believed has genuinely transformed them. They are not the person I once knew. So Saul travels and preaches to his former friends. It's actually in verse 29, we're told, he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, that is, as I say, his fellow Greek-speaking Jews. And how did they respond? Well, the second sentence in verse 29 tells us that they were seeking to kill him. Again, never easy to go back to the place you come from and live out your faith, let alone proclaim it. And when you do, you can expect often that the response will be less than positive. I don't know whether Saul had expected this, but whether he had, nonetheless, this is what he gets. His friends from before now become his enemies. The people he most longs to see come to know the Lord Jesus Christ resist his message. Temptation then might have been for him to clam up. But no, like Luther before him, if he'd been urged to hold your tongue, um, if he'd been urged to hold his tongue, he would probably have said the same thing. To act against conscience is neither safe for us nor open to us. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. And so Saul continues to preach. So much so, we're told, in verse 30, uh, sorry, verse 29, that that, uh, his friends want to kill him. And so much so that his friends discover, verse 30, the brothers learn that his life is under threat. And what's their response? Well, perhaps they recognise something that Saul doesn't, (laughs) Um, that there is a time and there's a place to preach, and there is a time and there is a place for strategic retreat. And so we read when they learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Again, it's interesting, isn't it? It's his fellow believers 
It's the people who, years before, he had persecuted and sought to put to death, who now save his life, who recognise it's no longer safe for him in Jerusalem, and so they accompany him to Caesarea and send him on to his hometown of Tarsus. It's the second time, if not the third, that the people Paul had persecuted are now responsible for rescuing him. And again, another sign, isn't it, for us, another challenge to us, that if the gospel has transformed you, if, if the gospel has taken root in your heart and then in the heart of another, no matter how greatly you've been injured, no matter how greatly your fellow believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has mistreated you in the past, when you become followers of the same Lord Jesus Christ, the dividing wall of hostility must be broken down. Hostility, anger, resentment needs to give way to forgiveness and mutual love. Now, as I say, I will come back next week to think about the implications of Paul's departure, the peace that then follows. I think here is just a good place for us to see uh, how God works in the life of Paul. Maybe, too, to recognise um, uh, that uh, after Paul's disappearance here, uh, we know very little about what happens next. There are at least some 10 years, we're told, uh, in Galatians 1, where Saul was mothballed, so to speak, before Barnabas came looking for him to press him into service in the church in Antioch. And maybe that's the good place for us to end. We, we know very little of what Saul did during those missing years, nor do we know why God would allow him to be sidelined for so long. Maybe there were a few rough edges to be knocked off in terms of personality, if not theology. Paul was clearly an effective preacher, but one who is very capable of ruffling feathers. It's possible to communicate the truth in a way that conveys a greater concern for being proven right than it does for winning over a hero. Maybe that's a lesson Paul needed time to learn. All those sorts of possibilities belong, of course, in the realm of speculation. All we know for sure is that for 10 years God set him to one side. And that too should be helpful for us to realise, shouldn't it? Uh, that for all of us there can be times when it feels like God's left us on the shelf, when we long to serve and we find God setting up roadblocks, when we have a specific sense of calling and God says the time for that calling is not now. How do we respond in those circumstances? Well, again, go to Galatians more so than Acts and you find Paul continuing to get on with serving in whatever ways he can. There is no such thing as wasted time in God's economy. When God sidelines us, he does so for a purpose, to teach us patience perhaps, or humility, or to equip us in ways we don't recognise until sometime later we're given the opportunity to look back and to see how God was working. We just have a wonderful picture, don't we, in this man, Paul. Uh, a man whose hatred of the things of God led him to persecute, whose encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ leads him to proclaim. Uh, a man who from the moment of his conversion was so bold for the truth he was willing to risk and even to lose his life. But a man whom God was willing both to use and then to sideline all of it to accomplish his purposes. And I guess the closing question I want to ask of us as we look at this man Saul, whose story will continue to follow further on in the book of Acts, is what kind of difference has the gospel has made in your life? Maybe you're here this morning and this is all Greek to you, all of it, not just the Greek words I throw in. Because you don't know Jesus as a saviour. You don't understand why anyone would be willing to throw away their lives like that. Well, if that's you, can I challenge you? Go back to the scriptures. Go back and find out what the promises of God were that Jesus fulfilled. Go back and find out what it means for the Bible to say that you're a sinner under God's judgment and that Jesus saves. But for those of us who do belong to Christ, can I challenge us too? That, that, that's not something that, you know, okay, now I believe and I get on with life as normal. The gospel must transform. It must make a difference. It doesn't turn everyone into a preacher, an evangelist, a pastor. But in the life of everyone who's come to know the Lord Jesus, there must be a hunger both to know him and to share that knowledge with others. So can I challenge us to pray that God will give us a deeper conviction about the truth of who Jesus is, a deeper desire to serve him, and a growing capacity to make him known. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these verses as we've looked at them this morning. We thank you for the example of Saul, this man whose hostility towards you was transformed in a moment and whose love and service of you then lasted a lifetime. Lord, I pray for each one of us that we will come to see the Lord Jesus in the same light that Saul did, as the one who alone can rescue and save, as the one who alone uh, can turn away your judgment, and the one who alone is deserving of our lifelong service 
and, uh, and trust. And Lord, I pray that you give to each one of us joy in serving you, a delight in knowing you, a growing hunger to know more of you, uh, and a power and a delight to make your son Jesus known to others. And Lord, as the, the churches in Damascus and Jerusalem were grown through the ministry of Paul, uh, as the gospel uh, grew through his preaching throughout the Roman Empire in later years, Lord, we pray that the gospel that we believe will make an impact not only on us, but on those who see us and know us and hear us. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to